A very good day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Singapore's Heart Foundation Health Talk. And today's topic is understanding and managing arterial fibrillation. And ladies and gentlemen, did you know that arterial fibrillation is one of the most common heart rhythm disorder affecting millions around the world? Now, in Singapore alone, 0.5% to 1% of our population has AF with prevalence of the condition increasing with age. Now, we all know that the most common symptom associated with AF is palpitation or irregular heartbeat. But do you know that you can also be asymptomatic as well, which means you have no symptoms at all? Well, joining us today, ladies and gentlemen, we have three great speakers for you. And first of all, we'd like to introduce, we have Associate Professor Ching Chi Kyung. Ladies and gentlemen, our Senior Consultant, Department of Cardiology, Director of Cardiac Electrophysiology and Pacing, from the National Heart Center, Singapore. And up next, we have Mr. Eugene Tan, Medical Social Worker, Department of Medical Social Services, National Heart Center, Singapore. And finally, Ms. Chan Pui Yi, Assistant Principal Physiotherapist, Singapore Heart Foundation. So right now, without further ado, talking about the topic of atrial fibrillation, the causes, symptoms, and treatments, let's welcome Associate Prof. Ching Chi Kyung. Good morning, and welcome to this session on understanding atrial fibrillation, the causes, symptoms, and treatment. I am Dr. Ching. I'm a heart rhythm cardiologist at National Heart Center. We heard from the chairman that the incidence of atrial fibrillation is very common. In fact, the lifetime risk of getting atrial fibrillation, or AFib, is one in three. It is more common in men than women and in population studies, we know that if you are age 55 and below, the chance of you getting an AFib is one in a thousand. But if you have the good fortune to live beyond 80 years old, the chance is 9%, almost one in 10 get AFib. And if there is existing diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, the chance of getting AFib increases. Now, what is atrial fibrillation? Let me point uh, your attention to the video in front of you. This is the heart beating in normal rhythm. It has a natural pacemaker. The impulses originate from the right atrium or the RA. And the arrow shows the flow of blood. You can see that it's very well organized. It seems to flow fast, first uh, in the right atrium or upper chambers of the heart. It then contracts and the blood goes into the lower chambers of the heart before it's ejected to the rest of the body. So that's a heart pumping in normal rhythm with a normal electrical system. Let me draw your attention to the diagram of video in atrial fibrillation. You will see, number one, the atrium is not contracting 
on a regular basis. In fact, it looks as though it's shivering. That's because it's beating in heart rates of excessive or beyond 300 beats per minute. Number two, you see that the arrows that depict blood flow, it's not regular, it's not fast. In fact, some blood stays or slows down in the upper chambers. And, get, and some of the blood is ejected into the lower chambers before it goes to the rest of the body. And if you note, the lower chambers do not contract or pump on a regular basis. Sometimes it's a little faster, sometimes it's a little slower. So that is atrial fibrillation, a very disorganized electrical disorder originating or arising from the upper chambers of the heart. It causes irregular heartbeat that goes fast or slow and causes lots of symptoms. It is an ECG diagnosis. Right. If someone is in atrial fibrillation, the key to making that diagnosis is to have an ECG recorded there and then. And this is a typical ECG showing someone with atrial fibrillation. Uh, it shows the electrical diagram of chaotic, irregular, atrial rhythm and fast ventricular response or the lower chambers pumping fast and irregular for no good reason. So what's wrong with AFib? First, it gives patients symptoms such as palpitation. The heart may go fast for no good reason. Now, if you are climbing the steps, carrying bags of groceries, walking up flights of stairs to the car, you feel the heart goes a little faster and a little short of breath. That's a heart rate and breathlessness that is appropriate for the level of exertion. But patients with atrial fibrillation may be sitting down, relaxed, having a cup of tea, but have rapid or heart rate that is inappropriate for that situation. Uh, they feel short of breath. They may tire easier, and some patients may have unexplained transient giddiness. As a result, there is a reduced quality of life. Um, there is also some psychological burden to it, and it limits their activity. Uh, next, it increases hospitalization. We do know of patients with abnormal rhythm or sensation or symptoms that requires an unscheduled visit to the clinics or to the hospital. And the previous video shows that the heart, the blood flow slows uh, in the upper chambers. When there is slowing of blood flow, there is a potential for clot formation. If these clots leave the heart and goes to the brain, the patient gets a nasty stroke. So patients with atrial fibrillation is at five times risk of getting stroke compared to those without atrial fibrillation. And lastly, if the heart goes too fast for too long, it may potentially weaken the heart and cause heart failure. This is one example of an ECG of a patient with atrial fibrillation. You will see that at 6.45 in the morning, on the left panel, the heart is going at rates of 160 beats per minute, which is inappropriate for that context. And within a few seconds, it slows down to 80 beats per minute on the right panel. A minute later, it speeds up from 80 beats per minute to 160 beats per minute. It shows the fast, irregular, and rapid uh, effects or features of atrial fibrillation, giving rise to symptoms of palpitation. And with that, they feel uh, short of breath. And that behavior of atrial fibrillation contributes and leads to impaired quality of life, uh, unscheduled clinic admission, hospitalization, strokes, and heart failure. And some patients may have uh, what we call transient atrial fibrillation. It means it comes and then it stops and normal rhythm is restored. This is one example of a patient with transient or paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Now you will see that on the left panel, uh, the heart was racing at 126 beats per minute at 6.48 in the morning. And then when it stops, when atrial fib stops and normal rhythm takes over, there was a five seconds pause. And understandably, that heart stoppage reduces blood flow to the brain and the patient feels giddy. If worse, 
In worst case scenario, if the pauses are longer, it may lead to unexplained fainting spells. There are also risk factors for atrial fibrillation. Risk factors related to aging, related to the race of the patient, being a male, put him at risk of getting AFib more than female, and their genetics. But if, if, you, if you look at the, the slide, essentially you could classify them to uh, if they have a patient have pre-existing heart disease, such as valve disease, heart failure, coronary artery disease, or they have acute illnesses, that put them at risk of atrial fibrillation. You would also see that there are other um, related conditions, for example, hypertension, uh, diabetes, kidney disease, lung disease, obesity, uh, increased alcohol consumption, smoking, or having a poor lipid profile puts them at risk of atrial fibrillation. If you have any of those symptoms as mentioned previously, unexplained palpitation, rapid heart rate, which is, which is inappropriate for that situation, you know, um, transient giddy spells for no reasons, you are uh, fatigued easily, you know, you realize your heart rate races, goes, uh, if you measure your blood pressure on a BP machine, the heart rate is high at 120, 130, sometimes it goes down to 40, 50s or, or 60s, go see a doctor. They will assess the symptoms, they do a physical examination, they'll do some basic investigations such as an ECG, blood test, and uh, if needed, they will start treatment and they may refer you to a cardiologist uh, or a heart rhythm cardiologist. Now, how do we treat atrial fibrillation? It's as easy as A, B and C. Number one, A, we would assess if the patient is at risk of getting a very nasty strokes. If they are at risk, we could start medication to reduce the risk. B, we provide uh, medication to better control their symptom. A medication could control the rate or control the rhythm. And thirdly, C, we take the opportunity to look for comorbidities, which means existing health issues such as diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, lung diseases, for example, we take the opportunity to modify the heart or cardiovascular risk factor, you know, uh, such as controlling blood pressure, stops cigarette smoking, uh, keep to a healthy lifestyle to reduce the risk of heart disease or heart attacks and heart failure. Let me go into details what is A. Remember A, is to avoid strokes and we provide medication called anticoagulants to reduce the chance of blood clot formation in the heart. Uh, there are new drugs such as apixabam, dabigatran, idoxabam and rivoxabam. Um, for those who may be on this medicine years ago, would remember the old drugs that we use called warfarin. Uh, all this medication serves to reduce clot formation. By doing that, it reduces the chance of strokes in patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, there are some lifestyle measures and uh, adjustment and diet adjustment when it comes to taking warfarin, less so with the rest of the drugs. We start medication to control the symptoms. Remember, uh, the previous slide shows a patient in atrial fibrillation with a high heart rate of 130, sometimes 160, uh, which is inappropriate uh, for that time or level of activity. We give medication to control that rate so that it slows down. We may want to give medication to restore normal rhythm, which means convert atrial fibrillation to normal sinus rhythm and maintain normal sinus rhythm. In suitable patients, uh, they may undergo a minimally invasive procedure called catheter ablation. Essentially, you put tubes or catheters, very flexible tubes from blood vessels. It goes to the heart. It records the internal ECGs or electrograms of the heart. And we deliver radio frequency therapy to melt away the tissues of its electrical properties. By doing that, we strive 
to cure, if possible, if not control, atrial fibrillation. And C, we take the opportunity to look at existing medical issues and reduce cardiovascular risk factors that may lead to heart disease. For example, we want to treat the hypertension so that the blood pressure is well controlled most of the time. We want to control uh, diabetes. We want to control sugar level. We want to do aggressive weight management. We should advise uh, patients to stop smoking, cigarette smoking, if they are doing that. You know, control the cholesterol, uh, control alcohol intake. If they have lung disease such as sleep apnea, that should be diagnosed and treated, and they should maintain an active lifestyle. All this will go to treating atrial fibrillation in addition to keep, keeping them in good shape and reduce other disease uh, development. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, um, if you are diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, it, it is not a death sentence. Healthy lifestyle measures, taking your medications on a regular basis and compliantly, which means take it when you are prescribed. Regular medical consultation with your doctor could help you to live life to the full, even while you have atrial fibrillation. Remember, treatment of atrial fib is as easy as A, B, and C. Avoid strokes, better symptom control, comorbidities, and cardiovascular risk factor management. So this has been Understanding Atrial Fibrillation. I hope you've gained some understanding, awareness of the causes, the symptoms, and treatment strategy for patients with atrial fibrillation. Thank you for your attention. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to Associate Professor Ching Chi Kyung's presentation. Very comprehensive and detailed as well. So ask yourself, ladies and gentlemen, what are you feeling? How are you feeling today? If you're not very sure, always seek medical help or look out for the doctors and they'll tell you what's wrong with you or what's right. All right, so let's move on, ladies and gentlemen. We have so much to cover. And up next, we have the uh, topic on social implications of atrial fibrillation. And to tell you more, let's welcome Mr. Eugene Tan. Hi, morning everyone. I'm Eugene, a medical social worker at National Heart Centre Singapore. And earlier in this forum, I think you probably heard from my colleague, Professor Chin, who shared his expertise with us about the causes, symptoms and treatments of AF. Now, over the next 20 minutes, I'll be presenting on the social implications of AF. And this is the overview of the talk today of which part of it will really be focusing on the social challenges that patients with AF experience. And then following which I'll be sharing about some of the available resources to help face these challenges before ending with some useful tips for everyone. Now, some of you listening in might be wondering, you know, why are we even talking about the social implications of AF? Isn't it just a medical issue but yes, you know, while it is a medical issue, and as we all know, patients are also much more than their illness diagnosis. So, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but most, if not all patients, will want to, be, want to feel that they are being treated as an unique individuals with their own needs, rather than just some queue number at the door or at the clinic. So as part of holistic care, beyond the medical, we are also interested in a patient's psychological state of mind, their social circumstances, and their spiritual beliefs of their illness. So this is actually the overview of the biopsychological -psych social spiritual framework that we, we usually use while journeying with our patients. And for the purpose of the talk today, I'll be focusing more on the social aspect. Now, so broadly speaking, you know, from the research literature and from my personal working experiences, there are three main social challenges that patients with AF face. And first is really about having work adjustments. Sometimes with a medical condition, some patients may find it difficult to return to what they used to do in their jobs. For example, some may be unable to withstand long hours of outdoor work 
or they are now not able to carry heavy loads as part of their job. And that's where we may have to explore other work arrangements. Now, okay. Secondly, some patients may feel depressed as they may struggle or find it difficult to adjust to a new lifestyle after their diagnosis. And this sometimes may also affect their relationships that they share with their family members or significant others, leading to a breakdown in communications. And lastly, many research has shown that stress can also trigger episodes of AF. And unfortunately, you know, while we all wish that life can be stress-free, but stress in life will never go away. And what we can do together is really to manage stress effectively. Now, over the next three slides, I'll be sharing on the resources available, namely in the aspects of first, employment support, social and care services, and self-care and self-management tech strategies. Okay, so I was sharing earlier, you know, some patients may find it hard to return to what they used to do in their jobs and end up having to look for other job opportunities. So these are some of the available resources that helps with employment support. So on your screen, you know, you can either screenshot this and then scan the QR codes for more information. Now, some of these agencies may sound pretty familiar. For example, WSG. You know, in recent times, you know, you have read in the news, not only they have only initiated the SG United Jobs and Traineeship Programs, but at the same time, they are also leading the Skills Futures SG Program that to encourage lifelong learning for everyone. And lastly, you know, be, beyond the government support, there's also private career matching providers such as Ingenious, which is a global job matching service company. Other private job matching services that some of us might be more familiar with would be like Recruit Express and Kelly Services. Now, sometimes, you know, when things are getting out of control and sometimes we would just want to speak to someone, you can, there are actually various self-help hotlines that you can dial in, which is on the QR code there. And alternatively, for some of us who prefer to have the face-to-face -face interactions, now in Singapore, we have what we call the family service centers for counseling support or simply someone to talk to, and there are 47 of them. So the family service center essentially is a one-stop service center really to service you know, their residents and families in the area that they serve. So on average, you know, there's probably one center in every neighborhood. And through the QR code locator, you can find your nearest family service center and including uh, even other social service agencies in your area. Now, through the locator, you know, if you need help with your day-to-day -day expenses, you can also approach the social service office for their Comcare financial assistance. And some of you may have also come across their banners in, their, in your neighborhood as you're walking about or going home. And lastly, if you know, care assistance is required, you can approach the agency of, for integrated care and their offices. If you're looking for a physical office, they are located at every main government hospital such as Tan Tok Seng or even SGH. Now, for stress management, you know, there are three main ways of where we can practice self-care, namely in terms of movement, nutrition, and the mental approach. And as Prof. Chin had shared earlier, you know, getting appropriate nutrition and exercise is also part of wellness in managing the symptoms of AF. <clears throat> so the next speaker after me, Pui Yu, who is the physiotherapist, will be sharing more about exercising appropriately. And you know, at the end of the day, some of the basic self-care habits that we can have is really getting enough sleep, continuing to engage in personal hobbies to keep us engaged, maintaining a positive outlook towards life and as well stress management. Now this is actually a short grounding exercise that you can do if you are feeling overwhelmed with anxiety. So personally, I find this helpful because it allows me to take a pause and to calm myself down 
wherever and you know wherever I may be. So essentially, it's about five, four, three, two, one. As you can see on the screen, it's about the five ranges from five things you can see, and you name the things that you can see in front of you, followed by four, which is the four different things that you can feel, and three it would be the things you hear, two things that you can smell or and the last one is the one thing that you can taste so alternatively for the for some of us who are slightly more adventurous these are the five senses and you can choose to reorder them in any way that you like so the key point is really just to take a pause in that moment and calm yourself down before moving on now so before i end the presentation or this talk there are five tips that I have for everyone and namely the first one is having knowledge about the condition. I mean so that you know not just patients but their caregivers can also be aware of what lies ahead and what are the treatment options that has been discussed with the doctors and really how then can we live with the conditions together. Next it's you know managing medications as Prof Chin has shared earlier in his talk, there are different kinds of medications and some of the useful tips is really to be aware of what are some of the medications and that the patient or is on and that may also affect what they can or can't do in life. Uh, lastly, is, you know, the next thing is really about noticing changes in emotions and moods and this is more so for caregivers. I mean, as caregivers, or family members, you are in closer contact with your loved ones and you are also likely, you know, the very first person to notice if your loved one has any changes in emotions or moods. So for example, someone who is very outspoken before the diagnosis could, be, could turn into someone who is very withdrawn and not sharing much. So that's also an indicator in which you might take some time to engage with your loved one and see if they will need to have a conversation or to talk together. Okay, the next tip is really make about making lifestyle adjustments together, such as, you know, instead of just encouraging him to go for walks in the park, but why not also join him or her in the exercise or in the, in the making the lifestyle adjustment. And that also could mean by going for healthier meals together. And lastly, it's really about spending time together either as a family or with your significant others. And this is also important such that, you know, patients feel supported while they continue to journey with the diagnosis of AF. So, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, AF is, as what Prof Chin said, it's not a death sentence, and but I don't deny that it is a diagnosis. So, it, so we really can't control what happens to us, but what we can control is our own response to the event that has happened. So I'd just like you to leave you with this quote that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of it is actually how then do we react to that. And you know, with that, I come to the end of the talk. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you to Eugene Tan, ladies and gentlemen. What a fantastic sharing, very holistic as well. So once again, some pointers for you. So once again, you need, if you need some help, please do so. Uh, there are various uh, self-help organizations available. Talk to them and find out more about how you can, uh, you know, be, be, uh, you can reach out to more people and share your problems or challenges. Well, up next, ladies and gentlemen, we have a topic on living with arterial fibrillation. And we'd like to have Ms. Chan Pui Yi to join us and share about the topic. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Pui Yi from the Singapore Heart Foundation, and I'll be sharing with you on exercising with AF. So this is the gist of my sharing today on how exercising will reduce the chance of getting AF, why must you exercise if you have AF, how to exercise safely, and exactly what exercises should you do. Okay, so I think Prof Ching has also shared this. So first of all, exercising and keeping active will definitely reduce the chance of you getting AF. And why is this so? It's very well established that there are many, many benefits of exercises, and these are just four of them. Exercise will help to keep your cholesterol and blood lipids, blood pressure, blood sugar, and body weight in check. 
if your blood pressure is not well controlled and you have hypertension, your risk of getting AF increases by 1.7 times. Similarly, if your blood sugar is always too high and you end up with diabetes, you are twice as likely to get atrial fibrillation. And all four of these, blood pressure, blood sugar, excessive weight and blood lipids will contribute to blockage of your arteries, what we call coronary, coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease and AF are strongly correlated. They are like best friends. You buy one, you get the other one. Buy one, get one free. Not only that, they can aggravate each other and seem to make each other worse. They are like two toxic bad guys helping, to do, helping each other to do horrible things to your heart. So that is why keeping active and fit is important. It really reduces your chance of getting AF. Okay, so what about if you already have AF? Must you also exercise? The answer is yes, definitely yes. AF exercises prevents AF and it also helps to prevent your AF from getting worse. So studies have found that more than half of those with AF have poor quality of life and they are very unfit. Exercises have been proven to improve their fitness and exercise capacity, reduce their heart resting heart rate. What does this reducing in resting heart rate mean? It means that your heart is fitter, it can do its job better and can rest better. So exercise will help to make your heart stronger. If you have AF, you must stay slim, not fat. Manage your blood sugar, manage your blood pressure, etc. so that your AF can be kept in control. Also, if you, have, if you exercise coronary artery disease, remember AF's best friend, cannot gang up with him. You already have one troublemaker in the house, you really do not want the other one as well. So similar to all the reasons why exercise prevents AF, exercise helps to keep it under control. Because really, at the end of the day, we want to live well, we don't want to be sick and disabled. We all know that AF increases the risk of getting a stroke. And the last thing we want to happen is to get a stroke, be unable to move well, unable to talk, and be disabled. The, if you exercise, the risk of getting stroke is reduced, even if you have AF. Okay, so we have confirmed CHOP that we must exercise. But we also know that exercise has some risks. For example, you may fall down when you exercise. So what are these risks and what can we do to mitigate these risks? The first and most important risk I need you to remember is that vigorous exercise, especially at long durations of hours and hours, increases the chance of getting AF. So for example, if you have been a competitive ultramarathoner for many years, you are more likely to get AF than, let's say, a Tai Chi master. So the advice is to do moderate intensity exercise that does not stress your heart so much for so long. If you have to do vigorous exercise, keep it to slightly shorter durations. Another serious risk is getting a heart attack, low blood pressure, or low blood sugar when you exercise. Okay, this is no joke, and you may end up in the hospital for this, which you do not want to. But if you manage your medical conditions well, take all your medications, see your doctor, drink enough water, stick to moderate intensity exercise. This is not likely to happen. It is also very important to check your blood pressure, heart rate and blood sugar before you start exercising. And if these are not normal, do not go and exercise. Okay, do not exercise if you are not feeling well. Bring sweets with you if you are diabetic. Bring your GTN if you have been prescribed. And exercise with a buddy will also help to ensure safety. Moderate intensity exercise about three to six mats, such as uh, brisk walking, gardening, all these are things that you should be doing rather than vigorous intensity exercise, such as uh, long distance running, competitive sports, football, and so on. Okay, for some of us, exercise can cause, cause knee pain, back aches, and so on. So to avoid this, progress your exercise gradually. Okay, build up your muscles with resistance exercise, to do different exercise, not always the same thing, to avoid straining any part. And warming up and cooling down will also help to av avoid this risk. Okay, last, there's also a small chance that you may fall or injure yourself when you exercise. If your balance is really poor, then you should really seek professional help. Otherwise, if you dress appropriately, exercise with a buddy, all this should, be help, should help. It is also very important to be alert and uh, aware of your surroundings. For example, 
there have been a, very, a couple of very unfortunate cases where a tree falls down and then kills somebody exercising at the park or at Botanic Gardens. Okay, but honestly, if you do not play too loud music, you should be able to hear the trunk breaking and you should have a bit of reaction time to jump out of the way. Okay, so moving on, how to exercise safely. When should you not exercise? When your AF or other health issues are not well controlled. If you're not feeling well, for example, having a fever, cough or headache, or if you feel your heart is beating too fast. If you have forgotten to take your medications, then do, do not go and exercise. Okay, after your a big, big, heavy buffet, please don't go and exercise. Rest for at least uh, one or two hours. Or if you skip your usual meal, then do not go and exercise. We do not advise you skipping meals and exercising because your blood sugar may drop a bit too low if you skip a meal and you go and exercise. And if you... If any of your heart rate, blood pressure or blood sugar is not within the, within the normal and not within your normal range, then you should miss your exercise. Okay? Because you must, remember that, you must also remember that the normal for others may not be always your normal. For example, the guideline for blood sh sugar should be at least 5.5 millimoles per litre before you exercise. But maybe for you, you find that your blood sugar may tend to get a bit too low and 5.5 is not enough for you to start off with. So for you, maybe you need a little bit higher before you exercise, so as to prevent getting hypoglycemia after you've exercised. Okay, what, do you, what must you check before and after exercise? Number one, heart rate. It is absolutely essential to wear accurate heart rate monitor when you're exercising. This is especially important because in AF, your heart rate, as what Prof Ching has shared, may vary by the millisecond, sometimes fast, sometimes slow. So if your heart rate monitor is not accurate and it doesn't pick up the changes fast, it will be quite dangerous. So for those of you who went to Health Promotion Board to collect your heart rate monitors, we do not advise you to use this for your exercise if you have AF. Okay? Because if it's not accurate, it's really of no use and in fact, it's very misleading. Second thing, blood pressure, another vital sign that you need to check. If it's too high or if it's too low, skip that session for that day. Thirdly, if you feel that you are having palpitations or if your AF is just worse that day or the day before, then maybe miss that session. If you have a home portable ECG monitor, please use it. Because nowadays, home portable ECG monitors are not very expensive and you can actually buy it for your own personal use. If you are diabetic or have previous episodes of uh, low blood sugar after exercise, then please also check your blood sugar before you wear your sports shoes. So you need to check, check all these before you put on your gears. Okay, notice the heart rate monitor on the left, on the picture on the left is the type using the chest strap. The chest strap is the most accurate next to using an ECG. So do not settle for anything less. Okay. Okay, this is just a checklist to help you to, to pr prepare for your exercise. What must you bring? First of all, wear sports attire and sports shoes. If you're diabetic, bring a sweet or two. Okay, uh, we have had, I remember there was this client who told me that he became hypo after exercise and it hits him so quickly, he really didn't have time to react. He always thought that maybe I have time to go to the shop and buy something, but no, it can be very fast. Okay, bring your GTN if you have been given that in case you feel chest pain during your exercise. Bring water, bring your mobile phone in case you need to call somebody for emergency. And due to COVID, you have to bring things like towel, face shield, hand sanitizer, etc. And lastly, make a date with someone to exercise together. Okay, during exercise, spend at least 5 to 10 minutes warming up and cooling down. Very important re reminder again, do not exercise too vigorously. Do not do anything that's too vigorous for you. You should not feel like your heart is going to burst. You should still be able to talk but you cannot sing during the exercise. Once in a while, check your heart rate and keep it within the target set by your physiotherapist or your doctor. Make sure you drink enough fluids. And as I shared before, be alert to your surroundings. For example, falling trees, wild balls that may come out in the park, traffic, e-scooters, e-electric bikes, and so on. Okay, just to make sure that everyone understood me, can anyone tell me who is exercising safely and who is not? Is it the young man in the red shirt or is it the old man in white? 
okay, yes, the young man is exercising a bit too vigorously already, but the old man is doing fine. He looks comfortable and happy and not pushing himself too hard. Okay, who is likely to be able to talk, to be able to talk during the exercise? The young man or the old man? Yes, the old man can probably talk, but not the young man because he's too vigorous. And who is likely to be able to sing during the exercise? Sing? Both are not likely to be able to sing. Okay? If you can sing during your exercise, like sing National Anthem or Happy Birthday, it means that the exercise is too easy and too light for you. And it's not hard enough. You should be exercising a bit harder. It should be a bit hard, but not too hard. Okay, exactly what exercises uh, should we do? First and most important of all is aerobic exercises for the heart. These are things like cycling, walking, jogging, cross-training, stepping, rowing, swimming, etc. Okay, we saw this just now, that these are exercises that use the large muscles over a period of time. For example, walking, cycling, swimming. Frequency, it is recommended to do ex aerobic exercise at least three times a week or more. The time duration should be at least 20 to 60 minutes, ideally at least 150 minutes a week. But really all this depends on your fitness. If you are not fit, then just go a bit slower and you can gradually build it up. Okay, intensity, this is very important. Which intensity is the best? Moderate intensity. That means a bit hard, but not too hard. So on the rating of perceived exertion scale, which I'll share with you in the next slide, the ideal should be 2 to 4 out of 10. Okay, So you can talk, but you cannot sing. And of course, try to keep within the heart rate set by your doctor or your physiotherapist. So this is the rating of perceived ex exertion that we use here in the Singapore Heart Foundation. If your exercise is very easy and you hardly feel like you're doing anything at all, you'll probably choose the small numbers in terms of exertion. But if you feel like you are dying, and like the last gentleman at the bottom, then you will rate 8, 9 or 10 for your exercise. So the most ideal intensity is to feel slight to somewhat severe exertion. Not too easy, not too difficult, just nice. Another category of exercises that you should be doing is resistance exercises that trains up and conditions your muscles. Strong muscles will help your heart to work less hard. Okay? These exercises may be done using the weight machines, dumbbells, resistance band, or your own body weight like half squats, pull-ups, etc. And lastly, stretches to keep your muscles and body flexible. These are also good exercises to do during cool down. Okay, I've come to the end of my talk, but if you do not already know the Singapore Heart Foundation, we run heavily subsidized exercise classes guided by certified physiotherapists experienced in cardiac rehab. We also have free nutrition and health talks. If you're a heart patient or have, or have somebody who know who is at risk of having a heart problem, discuss with your doctor to see if he feels you are fit to join us. So for more information, you can Google us or you can scan the QR code. And these are my references. And thank you. Well, thank you to Ms. Chan Pui Yi, ladies and gentlemen, for the holistic and wholesome approach to how you can take care of yourself if you have some form of arterial fibrillation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you have tons of questions to ask all our panel speakers. Now is the time, so please go ahead and type them and we'll answer them for you. Okay, so we'll begin with the first question coming from uh, Joy C. Now, this is going out to Prof Ching. Now, the area my, around my heart feels some sort of a pain. What should I do? All right, so um, let me give you features that are you know, due to heart disease. Um, chest pain, for example, that is triggered by exertion. If you're at rest, you're okay. If you need to pick your bags of groceries, walk up that one flight of stairs, you find that the pain in your chest starts. And as you continue climbing up, the pain gets worse. And with the pain, you feel breathless. With the pain, you should feel uh, cold sweat, some nausea. You know, it stops, or rather it prompts you to stop what you're doing. As you stop that level of exertion, which means you take a break, uh, the, all the symptoms ease off and goes off over time. That is angina or chest pain due to a blocked artery in the heart. 
those are typical symptoms of uh, angina, or block artery. Um, it could be a heart attack where the pain comes and stays with you. It's a very bad pain. It stays with you for more than 20 minutes. Uh, that you need to see a doctor urgently. If you are, you know, apart from this two uh, description, uh, the rest are a little hard to tease out as to what could it be. It could be muscles. It could be rib cage. It could be even a disease of the lung. It is well known that if someone gets a chest infection or lung infection, they may have some pain over the rib cage. Um, so if you are concerned, please see a doctor. They will help you assess the situation. Mm. We hope that answered the question. Now, coming up next, we have a question for Ms. Chan. Uh, this is coming from Min Song Ang. Now, um, I feel slight chest ache after exercises or some lightness after exercise, some dizziness. Is this normal? How do I know that it's serious enough to escalate? Okay, so like Prof Ching has shared, um, chest ache or tightness could be muscles. It may not be from the heart, okay, but we assume the worst. So we will definitely advise you to see a doctor or to, if it's bad, to even go straight to A&E to check it out uh, before you exercise again. Okay, and if they, all the tests has been run and this has been found that your heart is fine, then we will start ruling out the other causes. Could it be muscles or um, somewhere else that's giving you the chest pain? So I would say yes, it's serious enough to escalate. Uh, but uh, to help yourself, it's also good to monitor your symptoms. Like how long have it, does it ease after exercise? If you stop, does it go away, um, etc. Yeah, so yes, it's serious enough to go and seek some medical professional help. Mm. And the next question is for Eugene. The question says, uh, when do we seek help from medical social workers? Are there any warning signs to look out for before we seek help? Is a doctor's referral required as well for this? Mm, okay. Mm, well, for, to see the medical social workers, you can actually do it self-referred, meaning to say you could just simply walk in to say that you would want to see a medical social worker. And I think with regards to the warning signs, as you know, some of the warning signs that I can think of, it's really if you notice changes in your loved one behavior or in, their, in the way that they interact with you. So example, you know, suddenly they act out of the norm. Someone who is very introverted, all of a sudden, you know, after getting your illness, he or she acts even more introverted. She doesn't want to share anything. She's starting to skip meals. Yes, this is a warning sign where, you know, some professional help may be required in reaching out to your loved ones. Okay, so I hope that answers the questions. Thank you, Eugene. Now, next question coming from S. Egan uh, to Prof. Ching. Now, in general terms, what type of patients are considered suitable for catheter ablation? Um, that's a very good question. So, catheter ablation is a minimally invasive procedure where uh, the areas uh, that contribute to atrial fibrillation is melted away using what we call free radio frequency energy. It's minimally, minimally invasive. Um, just about six hours after the procedure, the patient is able to walk, you know, uh, and they usually go home the following day. Now, uh, who are the patients who may benefit from this uh, invasive, minimally invasive procedure? One, uh, the younger they are, you know, we would want to help control or restore normal rhythm without relying on long-term drugs. Number two, patients who are on medications, but despite medications, they continue to have symptoms related to atrial fibrillation. They continue to have, you know, unexplained or, sim or rather uh, uh, symptoms that limit their activities of daily living, it reduces the quality of life, it causes them to visit the hospitals uh, unscheduled uh, on a frequent basis. Uh, third, patients with a weakened heart function, for example, uh, you know, in a person with normal heart function, he may tolerate the inefficiency of the heart pumping action due to atrial fibrillation. But if someone already had weakened heart function, they really need the atrium or the upper chambers to contribute to the overall pumping action of the heart. So that group of patients may benefit from very aggressive uh, control or maintenance of normal rhythm. And there are others uh, 
for example, uh, you know, patients uh, like with, with a weakened heart, as, as mentioned, and patients who have side effects uh, due to the medication. So these are some of the category who may benefit from aggressive rhythm control uh, involving or using catheter ablation techniques. Well, we hope that answers the question. Up next uh, is right bundle branch block or RBBB also classified as AF, Prof Ching? Uh, short answer, no. All right, what is right bundle branch block? The, it, talk, it refers, uh, okay, let me give you a little background. So the heart has a electrical system and what we call a little electrical wires or wiring of the heart. So um, the lower chambers or the ventricles are wired in by three main wires, so to speak. And if one of them appears not to be working well on the right side, we call it right bundle branch block. So one of the wires on the right lower chamber appears not to be working well, but it is still reliant on the other two wires that will tell the heart to beat on a regular basis. So that's a condition related to the lower chambers of the heart. Atrial fibrillation is a electrical disorder that is related to the upper chambers of the heart. Mm. Well, we have a question from Ms. Chan Pui Yi. Now, what kind of exercises should I start if I have not been exercising for a long period of time? Okay. Um I, okay, so first of all, why have you been not exercising for a long period of time? So if you have been fine, you don't have any medical conditions, then, and you don't have any reason to suspect you have any medical condition, then I think you can start gradually with simple walking, brisk walking, progressing to brisk walking, and so on, increasing your duration. But if you have not been exercising for a long time because of some medical conditions, then we will advise you to... Um, check it out, keep it under control before you actually start exercising and uh, check with your doctor if you're okay to exercise because as I've shared, exercise does stress our body a little bit um, so we want you to be safe yep. uh, So what kind of exercise? The best would be aerobic exercises like I said, walking okay, for longer and longer durations and then maybe you can increase your speed maybe you can go slightly up slope for a bit longer, uh, progressing yourself slower. You can also do very simple resistance exercises, which I shared earlier, like half squats, um, that kind of thing to train up your muscles before you, uh, before you get better and better. And our next question is for Eugene as well. Now, can we only concentrate on our diet and exercise for self-care? As many times we do not get enough sleep um, and are we unable to, I mean, and if I'm unable to just fully relax due to my hobbies and my hectic lifestyle, what should I do? Okay. Uh, well, unfortunately, sleep is actually important to us. And, you know, having adequate sleep also allows the body the space and time to repair itself. And just to focus on simply on diet exercise without sleeping is definitely not enough. Now, I mean, granted that our hectic and busy lifestyle, you know, is, is, is affecting us. But I think at the end of the day, it's also how then do we manage the stress and prioritize what is actually important to us over the course of, in the, in our, over the course of our daily lives. Yeah. Okay, so with that, we have all the questions and we'll take uh, maybe one more question. This is from Mark Teo Kim Hock to Prof Ching. Now, how would health supplement for the heart example, uh, omega fish oil help in controlling AF? Let me tell you, um, medications that help, uh, as described earlier on, um, some classes of drugs would be like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, medications that restore normal rhythm helps. Uh, omega fish, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, I think it's a good health supplement, but it doesn't really help in controlling atrial fibrillation. I wouldn't stop someone from taking it if they have atrial fibrillation, but I'll tell them, uh, in addition to your fish oil, please take the medication that the doctor prescribed. Mm, hope that answers the question, Mark. Next question from Margaret Yeo. Hi, doctor. My heart rate is always below 50. 
now have gone for ECG tracking especially, especially and etc. Is it normal to have such a low heart rate? Short answer, yes, it is normal to have a low heart rate. Uh, whether the heart rate is appropriate for the situation is a more important question. I, I'm glad you have seen your doctors and uh, you're assessed uh, assess to be okay. Okay, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, we uh, thank everyone for sending all the questions. So we might have one more. Hold on. This is from S. Egan. Okay, let's take this final question. Now, when exercising with the app, the heart may hit the maximum heart rate very easily. Is it advisable to jog or just do brisk walking? Very good question. Um, with AF, the heart rate, rate can vary very quickly. It can sometimes be very high and very low. So yes, it can hit the maximum heart rate very easily. Uh, it really depends. If let's say your AF is pretty well controlled, then yes, I would say stick to your target heart rate and try not to hit the maximum so high. So I would say yes, go for brisk walking instead of jogging. But if you really feel like you cannot, you must jog, okay, and you, you will die if you cannot jog or something like that, um, talk to your doctor and your physio and uh, they can do a reassessment. They can even do a treadmill stress test or any other exercise stress test to, to see whether your target can be revised and upped a little bit. Mm, thank you. And next question going to Mr. Eugene, coming from Jenny Diaz. Now, uh, she says she has a heart attack last March 2020, and she has inserted two stents and one balloon in angioplasty. Now, she's also going for strength training at NTU Healthcare Hub for the past few months. Question is, is it safe or should I discontinue? Mm. NTUC Healthcare Hub is a place where they actually go for the daily exercises, but to, which, to answer the question whether it's safe or continue, I think if you're asking about medical fitness, you might want to check with your doctor about it. Maybe let me come in and say sure. a few comments. All right. Yeah, I think if you have a uh, um, standard and the arteries are opened, um, A, is, you, you're, the, you're the perfect patient to go for assessment with a physiotherapist or the cardiac rehab center. See them. They will assess you in a very safe environment. They will kind of know what's your sweet spot for doing moderate exercises. And depending on your personal goals, you know, you really want to be an athlete, you want to push yourself harder. Uh, that's a conversation you may have with a doctor and a physiotherapist. So um, please continue. You know, uh, it's best to exercise uh, in a safe environment, in a monitored environment, and with collaboration uh, with your physiotherapist. No, I also like to, uh, you know, um, I like, I like what, what Eugene said about self-care, self-help. Um, self um, very often, patients come to me and they, and they thought taking some pills would solve the whole issue. And, and the, the, the commonly, you know, as a, per, as a late, well, we, we hope there's a magic bullet or magic pill. I take it and all symptoms go away. I can go back to my usual hectic, sleepless nights. But what I like what Eugene said, it is a holistic approach. Uh, you really have to look into your other uh, aspects of your life and how you make, make adjustment so that you can cope with this better. All right. I also like what uh, Priya was saying, you know, if you're if AFib, you're right, the hurry goes fast, and hence you need to scale down on the intensity. Well, you don't really have a choice, you know, you have to scale down. If you feel that level of intensity is really... Uh, not useful for you personally, that you may have to uh, treat the condition better. Take more medication, you know, if it's not uh, to your satisfaction, does not help with your quality of life, you may have to consider catheter ablation. So these are things and aspects that you should consider so that you have a more, you know, a more holistic approach and have an idea of how this condition affects you, not just medically, or the risk of medical conditions or complications, but how it affects your mental health, your relationship with your family, the activities that you make or able to do with your family, and your physical uh, exertion and, uh, and ex exercises. So it's really a holistic experience. I hope uh, that's something that is conveyed during this uh, morning seminar. Mm. 
Well, more questions coming in from Ka Pasqua. What could be the reason a squirky sound that is, is felt during inhalation, inhalation of around mid 30s? Is this a dangerous? You know, it's very hard to give you an assessment over this comment, um, you know, over mm -hmm. the web or a webinar. I can't really download the symptoms that you have or the sounds that you try to portray. I suggest you see a doctor. That would be the best way. Mm. So there you go, folks. If you're not very sure, always seek medical help. And of course, if you're exercising, always start very slow and gradually increase, okay? Now, question from uh, Chi Hua Ge to Ms. Chan now. I understand that SHF conducts exercises programs for heart disease patients. Can I use these programs? I'm a patient at NU NHC, but uh, I'm not doing any exercises over there. Okay, yes, we do conduct exercise programs for heart disease patients. And yes, definitely you are most welcome, but I'm not very sure why are you not doing any exercise there. Is there a reason why they stop you from doing exercise or... Um, so that one I cannot comment and I would say you, you, it's good to discuss with them because uh, upon coming to SHF, you will also need them to write us a referral to, to write us a recommendation that you are fit to exercise with us before you can come over. Yep. And one more question from Rosalind Lee. Now the heart rate will go back to normal after medication but usually after one hour. Hour. Now, what kind of damage it will do to the heart if this continues every two or two, three months? Okay, let me uh, assume that this is uh, atrial fibrillation, that this patient has atrial fibrillation and the heart rate goes back to normal after one hour upon taking the medication. Uh, as mentioned, atrial fibrillation mm, predisposes or causes, uh, increases the risk of heart failure increases the risk of strokes uh, and also reduce quality of life. Now, the, some, some good news is that um, the longer they are in atrial fibrillation, um, the higher the risk. And the data, the studies suggest that if someone is in atrial fibrillation for prolonged periods of time, which means each time is at least six hours and above, then all this risk comes into play. If they are in short episode, then the risk, though higher than people without atrial fibrillation, is a little lower than those who are in permanent or continuous atrial fibrillation. Um, so I hope the severity or the, uh, the mild symptoms or short duration would not put someone uh, into a compla on complacency mode, feeling that, hey, if my episodes are short, I am at reduce or no risk. You're still at risk, you still need to take medication, you still need to have this treated. Mm. Okay, one more question for Eugene. This is from Lobo Tan. Now, may I know what are the medical benefits that the government can provide today? And is the government subsidizing uh, this healthcare for the elderly as well? Mm. What medical benefits? I think for a start, if you are a Singapore citizen and if you seek medical attention at the government restructured hospitals, there are actually government subsidies that help to provide, to cover the bill. And if you need any further you know, assistance with the medical bills, you can actually seek the assistance of the medical social workers at whichever healthcare institutions that you are uh, seeking treatment from. And as I was saying earlier, you know, to see the medical social worker, you can actually do a self-referral and just walk in to request to speak to them. Mm. Mm. I hope that's answered the questions. Okay, uh, what recommendations do you have for caregivers who are experiencing a burnout? Uh, okay, so this is actually a fairly common situation that we see most of the caregivers at. So first of which it's, you know, for caregivers that are experiencing a burnout, first of all would be for them to recognize that they are experiencing it. Now, after recognizing it, the next thing then it's really to, first of all, you know, look for alternative support. And alternative support can come in two forms. One, it's if you are experiencing a burnout because of having to care for your loved one, Agency for Integrated Care do have respite services 
that can temporarily relieve you of the need to care for your loved one while you take a break. And the other one, it's also, I would recommend joining a support group that can also provide you resources and, you know, compare with resources and methods or even other ways that people may have that have found useful in helping to manage and cope with the caregiving challenges that they experience. And some of the support groups can actually be found at Singapore, Singapore Heart Foundation as well. Thank you for that. Uh, now from Rosalind Lee. Now every time my AF strike, my heartbeat goes up to 200 for one to two hours. Must I go to A&E, Prof Ching? You know, the, if you're unwell, you should seek medical attention. That is the usual basic you know, instructions. So if you're unwell, please seek uh, medical attention. If you have to, if you can't get it from your nearby clinic or poly clinic, then you may have to end up at the A&E. Mm. Now, is the irregular heartbeat be able to felt or picked up by only ECG from Marilyn Go? The irregular heartbeat can be felt if you feel for your pulse. Uh, if you palpate your pulse on the radio, you know, on the wrist or on the neck, you can you are able to pick up the uh, rhythm whether it's regular or irregular. If you take your blood pressure with the uh, over-the-counter BP machine, they have, they have a little heart sign icon to show some irregular uh, heart rate, you know, if they detected it. But the diagnosis can only be made with an ECG because there are many causes and many reasons why the heartbeat may be irregular. A lot can be benign or not serious. Uh, we need an ECG to make an accurate diagnosis so that we can prescribe the appropriate treatment. Mm. As mentioned earlier as well, some of you can be asymptomatic, means you show no signs as well. So best to go for ECG checkup with the doctors. Now from uh, Cho J, now how likely are heart failure patients develop AF? What is the likelihood of developing AF out of uh, taking heart failure drugs? To what extent can actually aggravate heart failure? Heart failure puts a person at risk of getting atrial fibrillation. For various reasons, the um, pressure measurements within the chambers of the heart are different when the person goes into heart failure. It may aggravate uh, the condition, such as the pressure within the upper chambers, and that can trigger heart failure, or rather, and trigger atrial fibrillation. Uh, in our local study, close to one out of four patients may develop atrial fibrillation if they have heart failure. I take the drugs of heart failure because that controls heart failure, that improves the situation, and that should also try to reduce the risk of uh, atrial fibrillation. Um, why is atrial fibrillation, uh, why does it aggravate heart failure? Now, no, the heart is weak. It doesn't pump a lot of or enough blood out of the chambers already and when a person goes into atrial fibrillation the upper chambers are not contracting effectively it's shivering it hardly contracts or there's no effective uh, contraction um, and the upper chambers contribute close to 20 percent of overall heart function so in a person with normal heart function he may tolerate uh, not having the atrium to work very well. But in someone with a weakened heart, he really benefit from good contractile or good function, good pumping function of the upper chambers or the atriums. And hence, atrial fibrillation uh, can and will aggravate heart failure. Next question from Chui Hua Ge. I experience extra heartbeats every uh, early this year, extra heartbeats, but no medication or treatment uh, was done, as assessed by my cardiologist. Can extra heartbeats eventually lead to AF? And I also have moderate mitral valve regurgitation and also top normal heart size at the moment. I'm glad you have seen a doctor already. Have that conversation with your cardiologist. Um, depends on what kind of extra heartbeat that you have whether that leads to atrial fibrillation, uh, please 
have that conversation with the cardiologist since you seem to be fairly thoroughly investigated. Well, next question to Ms. Chan from Lucy Go. Uh, why is that treadmill test must do within a uh, minimum of nine minutes? What if it's less than nine minutes? I'm not sure. Is there a minimum nine minutes to a treadmill stress test, Prof? That, that I, I guess it's the, uh, what they call the Bruce Protocol, stage one, stage see, two, okay, stage three. Okay. And usually each stage is about three minutes, isn't it? Yeah. yeah okay. so but if, if uh, personally, I would think that if you are not well, they, let's say from the start you are not well already, they may not even put you on it. Okay, so because if, let's say you are well, and um, a minimum of nine minutes is to work you up to a certain level. Okay, so what if it's less than nine minutes, then they may not be able to conclude much. But if, let's say, after six minutes, you start to have chest pain, then definitely they should stop. They should not be pushing you to even more than six minutes beyond your chest pain or whatever symptoms that's not safe. So let's say after six minutes, for example, maybe your heart, your blood pressure is too high or your blood pressure is too high or your heart rate is too high, um, then yes, they should stop. But um, it, it really depends on the test uh, in that context. I can't really answer that. Yeah. Okay, last question from Ms. Chan as well, from Ka Pasqua. In terms of exercising and the busy work schedule, what is the minimum time I can at least allocate to do brisk walking or stretching? Is exercising like cycling, walking, uh, considered rushing to my workplace as well? Okay, that's a very good question. We are all very busy people. Um, I would not say there's a minimum time. I would not say that uh, you, can, you only did one minute this week. Um, it's not good enough. Any time to exercise is a good time. Any time at all. Half a minute, one minute, five minutes. Any time is a good time. And yes, you, if your lifestyle is really hectic and you don't have time to squeeze out for exercise, then uh, walking and cycling to the workplace is good, but rushing is not good. Because you don't want to be stressed. You don't want to be too stressed when you're exercising, having to beat the traffic or having to... The, the, the psyche of the exercising when you're rushing is a bit different. You're not going to get your usual benefits as if you exercise and you feel good and relaxed while you're doing the exercise. So I will not advise rushing, but if you're talking about cycling and walking to the workplace, um, to in order to clock the extra five minutes or ten minutes, yes, then that is definitely good. Well, we hope that answers your question. Thank you very much for all our panel speakers. Now, before we end, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite our speakers to share a closing remark to our viewers. Perhaps, Prof Jing, would you like to share a closing remark? Okay, with regards to atrial fibrillation, as mentioned, it's not a life sentence. All right, there are many things that you can uh, control to maximize the quality of life. Mm. So Eugene? Mm, I think adding on to what Prof Chin said, in terms of living with a diagnosis, the thing to bear in mind is really to manage the stress adequately. And at the same time, also remember that you're not alone this, in this journey together. That's your friends, family, and your significant others in this journey with you. Miss mm. Chan? Um, I would like to say thank you to everyone for all participating on this precious Saturday morning um, uh, and just keep fit and keep exercising COVID or not <laughs> <laughs> so with that I'd like to thank our panel speakers for joining us first up once again thank you to Associate Professor Ching Chi Kyung everybody our Senior Consultant Department of Cardiology Director of Cardiac Electrophysiology and Pacing National Heart Centre Singapore thank you to Mr Eugene Tan our Medical Social Worker Department of Medical Social Services, National Heart Centre Singapore. And finally, Ms. Chan Pui Yi, uh, Assistant Principal Physiotherapist, Singapore Heart Foundation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, for more information on heart health, you can also visit our website at myheart.org.sg or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash heartfoundation. You can also watch our video telecasts on YouTube as well on all heart matters. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we want to say thank you very much for joining us and have a wonderful weekend ahead. See you guys soon. Mm -hmm.